Hello and welcome to the next 100 Days podcast. My name is Graham Arrowsmith. And my name's Kevin Appleby. So, Graham, a couple of weeks ago, we got through, we were talking about uh, Dan Kennedy's Renegade Millionaire. And we were doing that for, for two reasons. We were doing it firstly to start to understand the people at the top of the money pyramid. Mm. And we were also doing it to understand a little bit about how you get to the top of the money pyramid yourself doing business with the other folks that are there. Yeah, um, well, you don't have to necessarily do business with, with the other people who are there, but basically you have to have the mindset of the ones who are there. Um, so, and, and the the sort of mindset things that we're going to talk about um, in outline today, um, are, there are seven secrets which are detailed in this uh, Renegade Millionaire book um, by Dan Kennedy. And what we'll do is we'll just go through some of those secrets with you today, because if you really want to achieve... Um, a breakthrough from your current way of doing things to the kind of results that these renegade millionaires uh, uh, get, then this is the podcast for you. Because what we're going to do now is go through some of the things that Dan Kennedy, who's known as the millionaire maker, and you know, not without not without reason. I mean, he's been behind a lot of very famous um, uh, people uh, around, but we won't go into that too much what we will do is we'll go into the seven secrets so last time we 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 covered a lot about um the money or the wealth pyramid where you have one percent at the top then four percent um who you know uh, are, are prosperous another 15 percent who are uh, doing pretty well and then 60 percent who are doing who are struggling to get by and then 20 percent at the bottom who are broke so basically you've got that pyramid and it reflects itself in lots of different economies, lots of different um, uh, circumstances. It probably, without without being too um, obvious, it will reflect itself in your town or in your um, county or in Newcastle or in Leeds or whatever. It will reflect itself if you were to gather up all of those people uh, and, you know, effectively rank them in terms of wealth you'll have that pyramid in one way or another. So it's one of those sort of uh, things that just happens, Kevin. So, um, but to get there to your point, um, he lays out um, seven um, strategies or secrets that um, he's found that actually the, the renegade millionaire would follow. And the first one is the power of organized effort. Um, and he starts this particular chapter by saying uh, most people's effort is not organized around any strict governance, organizing theory of business, philosophy or ethic, define a definite plan. None of that. Most people's effort is kind of loose, reactive, random. Um, I mean, this is what you would find in business anyway, Kevin. You know, most people get buffeted around rather oh, yeah. than having a very defined yes. um, uh, focus and, plan. No, great. We, we go right back to the name of this podcast, The Next 100 Days. Yeah. And the, the, the whole point of that is to say, if this is your issue, here's mm. what you can do in the next 100 days about it. But yeah, go, go and be on that, Graham. I'm, I'm in the process, as we record this, of, of planning out our very first strategy boot camp. Mm. In the CFO. Yeah. And it's it's going to be aimed at exactly that. It's going to be aimed at taking folk out of the day-to-day -day of their business, looking at the strategic objectives, and in particular, not just putting a business plan together, but getting into the execution gap. And I think that's where so many businesses have a problem. You, know? you can have a business plan on a page you can have some objectives you can have some goals but it's actually the nitty-gritty of getting down to it and doing the hard yards mm. make those goals happen and that's where you get buffeted with the day-to-day -day and all the stuff that's going on around you and, and so on i i had a conversation with somebody i've done some work with recently and um you know to, to take your point he had a conversation with his financial advisor in around the turn of the year. And, and um, his financial advisor said, go into this, go into that, go into the other. And he said, rather than doing any of that, I'm going to come out. Now, that was a pretty smart move. He came out of the 
the market at the time that the market tanked. Um, there's so much, there's so much chatter as we speak. We're recording this um, at the end of June uh, in 2022. That very shortly there will be a pretty severe uh, sell-off. There's going to be a pretty severe uh, stock market uh, reverse. There's going to be a pretty severe recession. What then? What on earth should you do? And now this really is in the. It's back to these comments that we've made in, on other podcasts of um, entering the conversation that, that people are having. Now. Most that, that you know to to apply this to the to the mindset that uh, or the uh, the power of organised effort. The power of organised effort would say and would suggest that if you've done your hard yards, as you would put it, and you've done the thinking. Why would you let your um, assets be buffeted, um, be, be be effectively washed away? if you could do something else to try and mitigate against that. And that's the, that's the, um, the 99% will wait and see, and then they'll end up with a portfolio that's, um, that's severely um, curtailed because that's the way in which the market's going to go. And markets do go that way and eventually they'll come back and maybe that's what they're thinking. However, 90, 99% of people will not prepare for it and they'll just wait until it happens. And that's basically the message of this, of this initial strategy. And, and what Dan Kennedy says is, is that, you know, far better to have principles. And a principle might be that you work damned hard for it, keep it. For instance, you know, the strategies might be to, to keep up with, for instance, the, uh, what's going on in markets, what's going on. Um, you know, just generally keeping your ear to the ground and listening to other people who are respected. And the tactics might be figuring out where you go for, in terms of your portfolio, what you would do with one part of uh, one set of money and moving it into other things that you might be able to, um, uh, you know, do better with in the next little while. So from an, an affluent person's point of view, looking at their portfolios right now seems to be absolutely in line with these ideas of, um, you know, the power of organised effort couldn't be more important because, to be honest with you, unless you do that, you're very much going to be in a situation where the market is going to determine how successful or, or how, how wealthy you are in a few months' time. Yeah. I think at the, the bottom of that, Graham, is that you've got to have a strategy in place. Hmm. You've, you've got to have some firm principles or some firm objectives to in which you're going to work. I think the difference between the, the person at the top of the pyramid is that that strategy is clear, but yeah. further down the pyramid, everything is very tactical. Yeah. Tactics well, well, are they've... only any good if they are part of an overall strategy. For most yeah. folk, that overall strategy is not there. I, th I think... We can. I'm sure we'll come on to time at some stage in in, in, in another in another secret. But if if you're if you're intent on watching Love Island um, back to back, and basically you're not intent on keeping up to date with what's going on around you, then you know you're one of the ninety nine percent, aren't you? You're, you're not one of the one percent who are basically um, you know who have principles, uh, who have strategies, and who are going to do something about it. Now, look, not everything's going to be. It doesn't mean to say. The actions they take are definitely going to lead to um, a stronger outcome. It's just more likely that it's going to happen. It could it could still mean that they'll they'll be you know they'll face challenges. But the thing about the one percent is that you you might take away my money, but if I put de dedicate my time, if you take away my time, it's a lot more valuable to me than taking away my money. I can always replace the money. And I always could do something else to replace the money, but from you know keeping what you know keeping and growing what you've got seems to me like a, a very sensible, um, practical application of this organised effort uh, secret. Mm. But I think it comes back as well with organisation. Yes, you probably want to have a three to five year goal. You need to be very clear on where you're going with that. But yes. Don't lock yourself into a plan at the same time, because many of the things that come up that are going to come along 
that are going to really work in your favour sitting here today, you can't imagine. No, absolutely. And and I think um, what, one of the things uh, uh, he would say is strategies without principles tend to dissolve in time or collapse yes. under pressure. There is going to be a lot of pressure in the next year or two. So, mm -hmm. you know, what should our strategies, or, or more, more important, what should our principles be yes. that determine those strategies, that determine the tactics? So, you know, if you start out, um, and, you know, if you said to yourself, Kevin, um, just thinking about principles, what would be a guiding principle in the, you know, um, the Appleby household? You know, when it comes to, say, money, probably don't squander it. Don't squander it. But um, there's also a principle that says don't go without. Don't go without. And, you know, the, you can understand from the way in which people have been brought up, the, the people around them that have shaped their thinking, your father, your family, your people around you, the people you went to school with, etc. The ones, the people who you have listened to have shaped those ideas and effectively that's what's driving your decision making the one percent start with very firm principles now you know as i sort of indicated before that might they might have a principle in and around money um now that you know the the one thing that i know about these people is they're they you know they're not given to throwing it away but the the whole idea of this is if there's a a sensible business strategy and you you can't tell me right now kevin that the one percent are not making plans to uh, uh, uh buffet against the, the the storms coming they're they're, they're shoring up the uh, they're shoring up their assets they're mm -hmm. doing things that might just give them um a, um a, a, a recovery the word buffet I well, what I, warren buffett is thinking about with the storms coming up <laughs> Well, yeah, that wasn't exa that wasn't exactly my point, but yeah, I, you can imagine that he will have uh, uh, plans because he'll have he, you know he's got into it. Now, if anybody's watching what he's doing and following what he's doing, then you're probably not going to be that far behind. So that that's the first secret, um, and the second one we move on to Kevin is make maximum money. These are the secrets of, if you like, the one percent, the renegade millionaires. And as you said right at the beginning, what is it that we should do to actually become a renegade or a millionaire? Uh, and entrepreneurs um, are not focused on making max maximum money. They are, are confused about the purpose of business, about their own responsibilities. And the confused uh, and confused people are dangerous to themselves and to others. They get distracted from making money by making divergent sirens and activities such as fads. Peer pressure, ego, habits, fear, social pressure, uh, what somebody or ev everybody else is doing. The, the key thing that he's saying in this area, Kevin, is, is this making money? Yeah. Well, stands to reason, Graham, with some of those things you just listed out, peer group pressure, social pressure, whatever. Yeah. If you're in the 95%. Yeah. Well you're with nearly everybody else. Yes. So the, the exceptions are going to be the people that aren't giving you that peer pressure. The exceptions are in the 5%, the 1%. Yeah. I, well, it's funny. I had a conversation with somebody the other day and that, 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 uh, to do with are these people likely to be found in, um, shall we say, the 1%, the want, want of a better term, are they likely to be found in, in social media settings? And it, it and the comment that um, is actually a colleague, the comment that uh, this uh, lady made is that she said, um, social media is almost designed to, to waste your time. Yes. They want you to stay on the platform. They want you to be there and comment and engage and all these nice, good things. But the 1% are not given to doing that because, as we said, Time is an important asset to them. You, you know, it's a bit like an aeroplane taking off with an empty seat. Now, that, that's interesting. I, I, I reflect back on a podcast that we recorded with John Lamerton, who's talking mm. about book Evergreen Assets. Yeah. And John was very clear on social media that 
even if you're not going in there and interacting and you're going onto social media for business purposes, yeah, whatever you're putting on there is actually very, very transient. Yeah. Yeah. Build your email list. Your email list's going to be there tomorrow, the day after, the day after that. Send yeah. an email out. Well, you can write an email once and you can you can use it many times because it's in a sequence or something yeah. similar. You go to social media. Well, you know, how long does a tweet last? Is, is a tweet valid for many, much more than five minutes? <laughs> is a Facebook post valid for much more than a day or a LinkedIn post for that matter? I, so, I couldn't agree more. And, and I, uh, I mean, don't get me wrong. It's almost like. You, you, there's some of this game you have to play in, in, a, in a marketing context. But having said that, um, it, the more it sucks away from your principles and your strategies, the more you're likely not to follow the the, the, the pathway to making yourself that um, you the best version of yourself, or if you say the most successful version of yourself, as in a one percenter. Um, that now one of the things that um, Dan Kennedy. Uh, uh, told told stories about is he used to used to do an awful lot of speaking from platforms uh you know from stages um and um what you know the the typical thing was you you do sort of a half an hour or so um uh, uh, uh stage you know um speech and then you'd encourage people to dash to the back of the the room where your people were waiting to take orders for the products that he was selling and um, basically, um, he had um, this was the Peter Lowe um, success tour, and he would extract maximum money from that tour, unlike some of the other speakers, um, by doing all kinds of different things that he could uh, uh, influence, like negotiate a higher percentage uh, compared to, say, others. He got 60% of every sale um, and, and he gave 40% back to the producer. Um, others were working on a 50-50. Um, he processed his own orders and credit cards rather than wait for them to do the same and then pay, pay him the money uh, a month or two down the line. He'd sell at higher prices than others. They really wanted him to sell at lower prices so there's more sales, but he'd sell at higher prices because that's what he wanted. Um, he'd have an order form that would sell and he'd pass that out to people sat listening to him, etc. There's a bunch of things that he said that he would do and did do. He'd follow up on non-buyers with direct mail and, and, and a sales letter. Uh, and he'd use dead time productively um, to to in, to enable him to get more things done. Um, most people don't think this way, Kevin. No, most no, people no, don't. And, 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 you know, those are examples about him and in that particular context. But if you're yeah. listening to this, you have that context somewhere in your business right now, somewhere in your organisation. You're allowing yourself to be, sorry to use the same word, but buffeted by others to conform, to follow the path, to, to follow what other people in our industry do. Hmm. And what he's really saying here is make maximum money. Does not mean to say that you follow the people. Yeah. And some of our making maximum money, Graham, comes down to understanding the value of what it is that you might be selling. Yeah. Okay. You, you can look at a price point in two ways. You can look at the price point of, um what is it costing me to put this together and in my case i might start with oh typically what's an hour of my time worth okay yeah. how many hours is going to go into doing this thing right great how many people do i expect to sell it to great do the math yeah there's the price but mm -hmm. i can look at that in a completely different way and a lot of online courses in in the entrepreneurial sector will be priced this way mm -hmm. and you'll see that a a typical course may be two thousand pounds now you know fine well that the effort that's going in for the person that's running that course if that mm -hmm. course is sold 30 40 50 times however many then the effort from that person doing it is nowhere near the maths of the total money coming in that, that it's a lot more than that yeah but a lot of the thinking there is saying well hang on Spend £2,000 on this course, and this will add £10,000 to your bottom line in your business. Yeah. Therefore, this is a good deal. 
Okay. Now, it's thinking like that that makes the difference here. What is the value of what you're bringing to the market rather than what is the cost of what you're bringing to the market? Yeah, I, I would build on that and say, say uh, uh, search for ways to achieve more with less. And, oh, and, yes. and, and if, you, if, you're, if you're actually delivering that value, um, is there some other ways? And we've talked about it. Well, you've talked about it several times on the show about to do with actually reusing. And you mentioned um, John Lamerton, but and, and his is one of the things he talked about on uh, when he was with us was uh, multiple uses for the same assets. Mm. So um, you produce um, um, a podcast. We can cut it up and use it within um, sales material. We can make we can make a um, you know, have show notes on there. We could do a, effectively a blog. Um, there's all kinds of ways in which you could use the same material, but use them several times over. And when, I, when I'm writing a training course, I'll often be thinking, hang on, what have I previously covered in a podcast where yeah. I might be able to cut out a five minute video clip on this? Yeah, absolutely. So, and that, and that basically is, is you're getting multiple value out of, this, uh, out, out of the same asset. Um, and I think that that's just another way of actually building um that kind of um uh equity if you like um that that business owners need to be thinking about within their own business how can i do something once and earn m many times from it um it, 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 there's one option with businesses is and, and I, i've got to say i suffer a little bit from this uh, that i i don't have many people who are um effectively doing a continuity income with me um they they tend to be the sort of the regular customers who know what i'm doing etc that's different from having a, a regular fee coming in from them every month now that might be something that um act and by having a number of people doing that from a business point of view it just layers it takes away any costs, et cetera, payments and, you know, the, the, your, your salaries and all that kind of stuff. Then everything else that you do uh, builds uh, value on top of that. Um, I, and I just, that, that, that's yeah. one point to make very clearly, Graham. Recurring income is yeah. something that you really need to look at. Yeah. Anything that is based on repeat business, mm. membership model, et cetera, will work in your favor. Otherwise, what are you doing? You're constantly in sales mode. Sales is a lot of effort. Yes. I'd say that it's it's 10 times harder to sell to a new customer than it is mm -hmm. to an existing customer for a start. Yeah. But if you can get that existing customer in a, in a place where it just happens, then Grow CFO, our premium part of the business, is a monthly or annual membership. Yeah. And it just rebuilds to learn the member says, no, I don't want this anymore. No, that's absolutely um, brilliant idea. You can, you can take that into many other businesses and um, take the health healthcare sector. My wife used to own a chiropody practice and yeah. I go regularly to a, to a physio. Now there's the hint regularly. Now, mm. As I walk mm. out of that physio appointment, it's, Oh, well, you need to come back in another six weeks, Kevin. Let's make the appointment now. Yeah, well, the, the, I mean, one of the points made in the book is that the value of a business rises as customer lifespan increases. Same revenue, same profit, but the business that keeps the customer for the longest span of time has the greatest value. Of course it does. Of course it does. So, and that comes through. If, if you look at um, John Warillo's book around valuing businesses, John yeah. gives, I think, seven different aspects of what, create value in a business when you're selling it um one is the overall size of the business but yeah. it's not as simple as that what what it businesses are normally valued on a multiple of profit so, okay mm. bigger the business bigger the profit great bigger the value but there's this thing are you multiplying that bottom line profit by two by three by four for your sales price one of the biggest things that will make a difference, what you're multiplying by, is the amount of recurring income that you've got. One of the things that the one percented uh, one percenters do as well, Kevin, is is this the idea of recurring income is interesting because he, they talk about current bank, future bank. Now relate this to either an event. I, mean, I was talking to our um, uh, new. Uh, 
events coordinator yesterday. And one of the things I wanted her to be focused on is getting emails and connections to local people that are enjoying various events. So we can actually um, cross sell other events to them as time goes on. Um, but the, and that's an example of future banks. So in other words, the, 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 the current bank is they've come to an event, they've spent so much money to get in or they're spending so much at the, at the bar but basically that that amount of money is current bank that's how much we've made so somebody says well how, how did that event go oh it's great we made x thousand pounds the future bank is the fact that we might have taken their uh, birthday or we might have taken their uh, wedding date coming up or we might have taken their email or we might have found out various other bits of information about them that were enable that would enable us to actually communicate with them um, over time to actually encourage them to use the facilities um, more at those times. So it's almost like you're writing predictability into your business. And I think that's a really important um, uh, concept. And then the only other concept that really came out of this make maximum money was the idea of um, it's not uh, it's not what we do, it's who you are. And we've talked about this quite a bit with books and various other ways of actually uh, shall I, boosting your visibility um, in the in the local market and the the most visible and the most um, appreciated shall we say person in a market tends to be the most uh, successful so moving from that um, um, area uh, we go to the third secret kevin and the, it's this is one that you'll like because you've always been associated with these but the power of big ideas. Absolutely. Mm. Big ideas, definitely. Um, now, think about all of the organisations that have really made a difference. Mm. That starts with a big idea. Or I'd go further, I'd use Jim Collins's phrase, the big, hairy, audacious goal. Mm. What is the big thing that we're going to do? What did Google do when they were putting together Google Chrome? Were they interested in how much money it was going to make? Were they interested in you know, all the features inside it? No, their focus was on how many users of this can we get? Because yeah. we know we've got a damn good product. It's the number of people that decide they're going to use it. Um, you can think of other other businesses, we talked about recessions earlier, Graham, but yeah. a lot of great businesses emerge when a recession's going on. You know, Google came out of a recession. Microsoft came out of a recession. Um, now, people with a big idea that then take action on it yeah. really makes a difference. Yeah, it, uh, it, within this section about the power of big ideas, um, it talks about um, the difference uh, between being um, a farmer and not a pirate. Um, and, you know, th there is there's a sort of a difference uh, going on there. And this is this is a big radical idea, he says, and it's still a minority uh, position within the speaking community. And mentioned that, in fact, he used to speak from stages. Uh, but I went in that direction because I, I because I quickly figured out that speaking was a crappy business at its best. It's a high paying job, but it isn't a business. Um, so basically, one of the things that he was going down the, the lines of is he, he wanted to become um, um, as opposed to a pirate um, where they sort of leave home. They, they plunder when they're there and then they bring it back home and you know and that that's broad broadly it he wanted to be a farmer so the idea of the farmer we've kind of touched on in other podcasts but basically the idea of creating a farm where he can actually nurture them and make them bigger and the 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 community that he, he builds in and around his services uh it, you know continuity uh, lots of different products being offered to those, those people. It's this idea of keeping their details and actually making friends of, if you like, of these people. Um, and, the, and you farm to, to grow bigger and better beasts that pay you more. So um, an interesting um, uh, way of looking at uh, this. Um, and so that what I'm going to do, because of time, we're going to scoot on, Kevin, to the fourth secret, which it is to take control of your time your business and your life. 
So are you taking control of your time, your business and your life then, Kevin? I'd hope so, Graham. Yeah. I still find that just about every day goes by where I don't have time to fit everything in that I want to do. Um, and that's that's the nature of, of probably being in a, a new business, a startup business, a business growing quickly. You know, mm. There will always be more things to do than there is time to do them in. But yeah. that, that also means that you've got to be selective. It yeah. means that you've got to pick out the most important things and yeah two ways you look at that um number one is being very choosy about which objectives you pursue you know there are 10 different things that we can do in the next quarter which one of them is going to make the most different okay and be fairly choosy that way there's also something when you get into the, the day the week you know? Lots of things, even when you've been selected and you're pursuing one objective, lots of things can come along on a day-to-day basis and buffered you. I think you've got, to, you've got to be fairly rigorous with the plan and say, well, if nothing else, what's the one thing I'm going to do today? What are the yeah. two, three things I'm going to do this yeah. week? Otherwise, you find that for all you've got these principles and these grand objectives, you've actually... Three, th- three weeks, four weeks, four months down the road, you haven't actually moved any closer to those objectives. No, maybe Love Island got in the way, or or, oh, um, yeah. or, or some, you know, some some of the um, squandering of your time. Mm-hmm. Um, um, but the, I guess it's about protection in a sense, because effectively, if you think about the amount of money you spend on insurance, Kevin, for your home, um, for your car, um, for your um lives maybe in terms of life insurance and so forth um but you don't insure your time do you no and and really very very few people um do the one percent on the other hand have a have the mindset that says my time is far more important than the money that i've got don't Mm. get me wrong i'm not gonna i'm not gonna blow the money that i've got but my time to make more money and to become even more successful is, is, is absolutely sacrosanct. And um, that's one of the things that distinguishes um, Kennedy from a lot of other people you might have heard of. You, you, you know that the, the stories about him not having um, internet access and uh, mobile phones and all that. You, you, you can only get a message to him via his fax. There are there's there is logic to determining and controlling the access other people have to you, because the more access they have, you know the phone rings and you stop something that you've been working on. Um, you know we 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 talk to um, the app producer uh, Patrice Archer the other day, um, and um, one of the things he talked about is an app that is called Off the Grid. So you switch your phone off. And if you want to switch it back on, you've got to contribute to their profits. Well, as a Yorkshireman with a Scottish mother, um, I, I, you know, it's, it's, that ain't going to happen. Um, so the truth is it'll stay off. So, But it, I do like that sort of thinking. And I think there are other, um, I was told about something that students use and so forth. And you can see that a tree's growing if they're not using the phone. That sort of, it, it, there are other apps that, do, that are doing something very similar. But I think it's really important that you put, you you know, to take control of your time means that you're likely to be taking control of your business and your life. So two two observations I'd make there, Graham. Number one is if you're aiming to do business with people at the top of the pyramid, Mm. they probably are very concerned about their time. Yes, they are. As you try to do business with those people, do not waste their time. No. Respect that time. It Mm -hmm. is valuable. Yes. I couldn't agree more. And you know what? um, One of the things that um, Patrice um, uh, in that app thing uh, mentioned was how important experiences are. Because it doesn't mean to say it's all work and no play. The logic is, is that they use their time extraordinarily efficiently. So effectively, they have more time 
to do the things they want to do on their terms, when, whatever they and, and whenever and wherever they want to do those things. Yeah. So if you then offer them something of an experience, that fits into that sec- second category. But to get to that place where they they have no, um, uh, shall we say, money money challenges, if you like, um, and they have the time to do whatever they like with that. That there's an awful lot of time management that goes into doing that and time restriction that goes into doing that. So uh, th- I think that um, it's it's very, very, um, very important. Um, and one of the concepts that c- comes up in this one is to think like a parasite. One of the most effective m- ways to save time and money specifically related to the energy and expense it takes to acquire customers is to form alliances with other businesses who serve your market. Now, this is a strategy that's absolutely top of my mind as I speak with a new client, is by, is by communicating through, and we had uh, Sedge Beswick on a, couple, uh, a few weeks ago, uh, who's a leader in the sort of influencer sphere. And the logic is you're, a, you're an influencer, therefore people follow your lead sort of thing. If you are able to make deals with influencers or with other people with audiences, um, then it's a, it's a short way to cut the time to uh, serve, in your, uh, serve in a market. So you become a parasite. You leverage their audiences and it's a quick and easy and very effective marketing strategy. And you know, we, we had another guest just a few weeks ago, Dave Plunkett. Yeah. We, we spent the whole podcast talk, talking about partnerships, the power of partnerships, and how he gets involved in bringing businesses together to do great things. Yeah, that he calls himself the collaboration junkie. Um, but there's a lot of sense in that because effectively you can actually leverage other people's um, uh, markets very quickly. Uh, and particularly if you've got a large goal to achieve quickly, mm. which of course the 1% always have, you know, as you said, the big, hairy, audacious goal, then how are you going to do that? Little by little, mm. one, one way of doing it, but you might have uh, not much life left at the end of your strategy. So the, the issue is, can you get to that goal quickly? Uh, and you can potentially do that by engaging uh, the idea uh, and the, the opportunity, um, if you like, by using other people's relationships. Um, and and um, that's one of the strategies. Um, yeah. So that What a team can do is, is always bigger than the sum of the parts. Yes, absolutely so. And uh, the... The, some of the same themes that we've discussed already, like, uh, you know, a lot of a lot of us like to think that we are um, really creative and we've thought of this new thing. It's round and, you, you know, it's, 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 it looks like a wheel. So it's, it's our wheel, though. We, we, we've actually developed our, our, our own wheel, et cetera. And you think, hold on a minute, the wheel exists. So the, 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 the 1% won't start from scratch ever. The 1% will be looking around to see what is there and how can that be leveraged to make something new. So it, it does not necessarily mean you have to start from scratch. In fact, you should put a line through start from scratch. And that is a mental principle that these uh, 1% one percenters will and the renegade millionaires will have and the other point to to um to effectively managing your business and your life is uh to to quote uh, the book it's money loves speed uh, and you understand you have to understand that like renegade millionaires they understand that money is attracted to speed they do whatever they can to shorten the time between an idea and the actual appearance and introduction of that idea into the market where it can be offered and sold. So yeah. speed's really important. And, you know, I've fallen foul of that in one of my businesses where I've been too slow. Um, but, you know, in other, in, in, in an, my main business, I've actually been quite quick to change to certain things. So from that point of view, um, you know, I've, I've kind of seen it on both sides, Kevin. Yeah, and we talked about apps last week. 
Um, no. You've got an idea for an app. Mm. Get it out there. No. Never apps and thing, things like that, but any form of tech will come out as an initial version, and then there'll be new versions coming along, getting better and better. No. You may well be imagining a, a product, an app or whatever that does all sorts of things. And you may not feel as though you want to take it to market until it does everything on your list. Yeah. The truth is that's going to slow you down. Get something out there that's got the basics, the things that most people will use. Get it out there, get people liking that, and then bring the additions along later. And the, the, the yeah. concept is minimum viable product. Well, I don't like that word viable, but it's yeah. it gets something out there that people can use fairly quickly i i, I think um the the discussion that we had with uh, patrice patrice archer was very much along the lines of you know um i would call it a scamp in in print terms but he, he called it a wireframe which is effectively just a way of actually outlining yeah. the look of a, of a of a website or or in this case an app maybe then just dropping in a few images so that you somebody can appreciate how the wire because if you look at a wireframe in reality it's quite difficult to, to read sometimes so you, yeah. you drop in a few images and all of a sudden oh, all right, i get it now but you wouldn't have the code that would make it sing and dance you'd basically sort of show them one page and then it moves to another one and then it moves to another one what do you think let's go back Graham, to, the, to your time is valuable you know mm. yeah you, you spend weeks and weeks and weeks putting something together yeah and it tanks then you've lost a lot of time yep. you go with yep. that wireframe and it's oh it doesn't work yet but this is what it's going to look like what do you think and people say nah yeah, uh, I see where you're going, but I'm never going to use that. Well, fine. Yeah, more it's likely they'll, they'll 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 more likely they'll come back and give you the feedback that'll make uh, it the product they would use. That's exactly what I was going to say. That they they they'll they'll add the little bits. Some because people can't help themselves. You know, they've always got an answer to something that being that they're, they're, they're looking at. Some of which you'll ignore completely. Some of which, some of which you think, ah, oh, hold, hold on a minute. I think this is what they're really uh, telling us. And you know, the the lovely thing about that is that people are then bought in to what it is that you're producing. You know? Yeah, they've because they've given you the ideas, they've given you some design, they've they've got a an element of ownership of the product, even though it's not theirs. We could talk about this for a long time, and but we're not because we're going to go straight on to secret number five, Kevin, and it's. Have we only got to number five, Greg? I know, I know, but we, we will get there, but we have to be quick. So uh, accurate thinking is secret okay. number five. Um, um, and, and Kennedy uses accurate is as in knowing facts you may not want to know. So, and, and those are the ones that we tend to sort of like, oh, oh, I don't really want to hear the fact that I'm doing something that's a bit stupid and I could do a, be a better job by not doing it. Um, so that's one of the things that um, um, I, I kind of means by that. So um, the idea of uh, gathering empirical evidence, etc. So accurate thinking is is sort of sl somewhat devoid of, uh, of emotion and it, and it, it helps you make um, um, better decisions. Yeah. But that, that should be true all the way through business. And certainly mm -hmm. in, in the field that I work in, it's, it's linking data with the decision-making process. It is so, so important. Yeah. I mean, um, I, I think there's, there's, there's a fair bit to, 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 to get, get through in this, but it's, it's this idea of actually um, uh, um, thinking clearly, um, accurately with sensible empirical data i mean one of the one of the people i i really re admire um in when it comes to things like website design um is and we've had one of his uh, daniel uh, uh, burstein we've had uh, him from uh, marketing experiments mech labs um and what they're all about and have been all about for about 20 years is um is uh empirical evidence what's there rather than you know, ha they've seen it happen. They've tested this hypothesis. Then this has happened. That is a far more convincing and compelling way of trying to achieve a better result from something like a website or an app or whatever else. How many people, as I say this, will this ring a bell to? You look at your website 
And it is the way it is because you looked at somebody else's website and to some extent copied it because you thought that was quite good. Yeah. Now, there is a huge amount in business in your industry, your market, that you follow what everybody else is doing. Okay. Mm. And simply what Dan is saying by the, this accurate thinking is don't assume because the company down the road is doing this mm. that it's the right thing to do. Yes, absolutely. Don't copy, think it through yourself. I yeah, think absolutely. My, my yeah. biggest lesson in accurate thinking. Yeah. And the, okay, um, I'm going to scoop now to secret number six, um, and that's to create a composition. Let's try again to create a competition free zone um and um uh, now we can skip through that one quite quickly graham because we we actually recorded an entire podcast on competition free zone yeah we did um so and what we'll do is we'll put a link to that um but you know the 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 key things about that were stat about being able to stand out um and just businesses business people are just not really ready to do that um by raising your status, we talked about books, by showing up alone, uh, that's by going to events that might not necessarily seem like your events, but your potential market um, are there. Um, and then, uh, you know, having uh, what he says, a strong predetermination um, and, um, you know, looking at by being very clear about what your objectives are when you're going to some uh, place. And, and to exploit your the time invested. So I think there's a whole bunch of um, uh, things that you can do to create a competition free zone, but we'll we'll link uh, to our previous podcast episode on that. So the final one, Kevin, we got there eventually almost yep. um, was uh, it's kind of been covered elsewhere, but we, we've got invent less, implement more. So these are the seven secrets that get you, if you can actually adopt them at a principle level and, and then apply them to the things that you're doing, this is, you're in danger of improving the, the, the money that you get for your business and getting yourself into a position where you're um, crazily successful. Um, but people really like creating rather than implementing. If you look at people's CVs and... I created this, I created that, I created the other. If you say, I implemented this, it sounds like somebody else has created it. But if you actually add to the end of, I implemented this, and it led to a 600% increase in sales. Yes. Um, you know, it's got a much better ring than I created a, a, a new, um, I don't know, folder for the sales uh, plan. I mean, at the end uh, of the day, it's... Yeah. It's not being about creative. It's about implementing. Um, I'd, put some, uh, I'd put a really slightly well. different spin on that, Graham, and say, mm. fine, most of us will start by creating something. Mm. There's always a danger because we are creative individuals that you'll, you'll see something else. You go off and create a second thing yeah, without ever taking the first one and taking it all the way to where it could be. Mm. Okay. to me that that's what you, you're in a business you, you're delivering training courses you you've got a fantastic program and straight away you think oh great we've developed that program let's develop another program well mm. have you actually should you not be spending the time before you develop program two actually fully implementing program one where yes. can you take it to is there a different audience for it is there another way you can do this you, know, you can you can leverage that one asset you've already created we uh, it's a great point um and um they if you implement more and invert less then basically the thing that's really you're saying is the boring stuff is what makes the money and actually, just to your point, it's it's that have I fully implemented this course? And, you know, that might mean that you're thinking about it as um, going back to the sort of John Lamerton thing of, you know, multiple uses of the same asset. You know, is there are there other ways in which you could actually leverage that content, that course that enables you to drag other people into your um, into your business um, and then obviously grow your business? So the. It's that kind of curiosity about what you've got rather than what you might have. 
And and I think that... Well, I'll give an example of that, Graham. In, in Grow CFO, we've got the Future CFO programme. And the right, yeah. final module, module nine, one that, one that I run, is your first 100 days as a CFO. So you've been on the, the programme aiming to get you to CFO level. You've got there. So how do you take, how do you spend the first 100 days in your new job? Then it occurred to us, well, hang on a minute. Most of the principles that are in this, this particular module apply to your second job, mm. to your third job. It might even apply to you moving into a head of finance role before you get to CFO. So we then took basically the same content was in that module. And we said, right, that's a, a standalone mini course called your first hundred days in your new finance role. Yeah. I am. Um, um, th- there's so much more to, to, to cover in this, but obviously when you talk about implementation, you are talking about processes. Um, it's not just about what happens. It's about how it happens, where it happens, when it happens. And, and, you know, it, it is boring, but it's the kind of detail that makes you, uh, you know, that accurate thinking that makes you um, uh, plan out things that are, are likely to g- generate. And once again, I'm plugging important. John Lamerton's book, Evergreen Assets, because John looks at so many different areas of your business. It's not just, oh, we need some evergreen assets to do the marketing stuff. He's got evergreen assets all over the place. Yes, absolutely. So, um, you know, by you know carefully determining what the problem is, and then focusing on the real problem, so you you avoid the un- unending redecorating of a room. Mm-hmm. Do the boring stuff, lock it down, load it, and sell it. Yeah, you know, and I think there's there's so much detail in this. We'd recommend you buy the book. It's not gonna it's not gonna take. And and there there's um there are courses around this uh, from um uh you know the dan kennedy sort of empire that you can actually take and spend a lot more money and i'm sure we we have only just done it uh we've skimped through it but there's so much of interest there that might make you and your business um that much more successful that you know i would just recommend this book um as you know because who else is going to tell you about the one percent you might pick up bits but this is the kind of behavior that those you know self-made very very successful people have got baked into their dna yeah so if you want to do business with those people you've got to understand the way that mindset works so Mm. all seven of those secrets that we've gone through are things you need to understand when dealing with anybody at the top of the money pyramid but equally they're things that you can put into into practice for yourself to get you further up the pyramid. So again, Kevin, um, it's been interesting and a nice chat um, and hopefully a few ideas shared uh, and hopefully our listeners today will have got some more thinking uh, done about being a renegade millionaire and hopefully the secrets that we covered today, um, albeit at a pace, will encourage you to probably pick up the book, but also... Um, start implementing and doing the things that um, uh, that the book recommends. Brilliant, Graham. Thoroughly enjoyed it. And I have got the book on my Kindle, which I've skimmed through. I've yeah. read the first bit of it, and it's encouraging me to get into this and read much, much more about what Dan's got to say about each of these secrets. Well, um, great. Uh, that's really good news. Um, today, I've been Graham Arrowsmith. I've been Kevin Appleby. Goodbye. Goodbye. Goodbye.